Thank you, Shelby, and uh, thank you for uh, organizing this seminar series. Uh, also, my thanks to Recent Public Library uh, for arranging an event like this. Uh, can people in the back hear me? Okay, good. I'll try to keep the voice at this level. Hopefully, it will not drip down as, it, as the time goes. Uh, so, to give you a background about what I do, uh, I was, after my schooling, uh, I did bachelor's in metallurgical engineering. Uh, which is a rather rare field, not too many people get into that uh, in India. And then I worked in an integrated steel plant, so uh, where I was working on how to make steel from literally dirt which is mined away, mined from some place, and then it gets molten and it gets cast into steel sheets, uh, which goes and becomes the uh, car side panel and other things. So I was in the process research and development division in that uh, industry. It was they used to make about nine uh, million tons of steel a year. Uh, and then after about two years, I I found myself uh, craving for a little more fundamental science uh, investigations. So then I ended up uh, getting a research assistant position in University of North Texas in Denton, where. Uh, my project was an NSF, National Science Foundation funded project, uh, to look at uh, titanium alloys. So these titanium alloys are actually very important for aerospace applications. So one of my project was to look at uh, some of the titanium alloys which are used for landing gear applications uh, and trying to again go into the nano world of these titanium alloys and understand why they are as strong as it is and why they are as light as it is. So that was my PhD uh, project. Uh, so I finished my PhD in 2011, and then I joined Pacific Northwest National Lab as a postdoctoral fellow in 2011. And then uh, since then, and, and I got transitioned to a uh, staff scientist in 2012. And right now, I'm literally working on probably, in a year, I work on 15 to 20 different projects. So which, as Shelley was pointing out, it ranges over a broad array of stuff. So I'll give you some glimpse of what all I uh, work on uh, within a span of a year. Uh, but I'm not going to obviously talk about all of them, uh, and we don't have that much time. So now, in this talk, it's just my name there, but one fact about PNL is that almost all the projects that we do are multi-people, multi-team projects, where uh, one person is contributing one aspect of the problem, but typically, there's a group of probably 20 or 30 scientists who are all experts in their own disciplines contributing together to one giant project. Okay? So a lot of the time, I will, I'll be representing some of the stuff that is done not just by me, but by my team. Okay? So that's something which you should know that in PNNL, it's all about teams and uh, a lot of us work together and make things happen. So now going into my talk. So, as we all know from, uh, from the media, uh, humans have been looking out into the sky for many, many years. So, all these telescopes, so the picture out here is the Hubble telescope deployment into the sky. Uh, and Hubble, Hubble has actually collected some magnificent images of the outer planetary world and other things. Uh, there are some excellent uh, observatories out there which can again look far away to large things, light years and uh, farther away. Uh, that's an image of the solar, uh, the sun, uh, again, uh, brilliantly captured by some very powerful uh, telescopes. Uh, now, the interesting thing which is less known is that we have also looked to things that are smaller and things below what we can see. But that's not as well known unless you get into that field as much as astronomy or looking out into the uh, extraterrestrial spaces. So the way the history of microscopy came into picture is uh, in year in the first century AD, uh, so year 100, uh, Romans invented glass, and then there was an interest in looking through different shaped glasses. Uh, so look through clear glasses uh, shaped different in, in, in different forms. So there was interestingly, somebody had a glass shaped like a lentil. So <laughs> center was thick and the edges were thin. And they found out that if 
they hold it in front of something, it magnified the image. So from there, lens came into existence. And once this lens came into existence, people figured out that if they assemble a couple of lenses inside a tube, they can magnify things and look at all kinds of things. So one key person was Robert Hooke. He started looking all across. I mean, you can imagine as a person who first found out this nano world, he got really fascinated about the world around him. So he published this interesting book uh, named uh, Micrographia. I don't know if you can read it from there, but it's uh, Micrographia or some philosophical dis descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses with observation and inquiry thereupon. So that's an interesting title itself, right? So he's basically looking at all minute bodies around in the world uh, using his microscope. Okay? This book was published in 1665, so really early. Uh, this was the drawing of his microscope. He had a light source, which was probably a uh, candle burning or something. He would focus the light uh, on through and pass it through a sample, and that that image, that the light coming through the sample would get magnified through the microscope, and using the eyepiece, he could see it uh, sometimes magnified. So one of the most interesting finding was this: uh, he was the first person who uh, saw cell, plant cell. So he looked at cork, and he found out he took the first image of the plant cell. Yeah. Another key person is Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, who actually read this book and got inspired about microscopy. So then he made his own uh, microscope, which is uh, you have two screws, one this way and one going this way. Uh, and there is a glass bead which acted as a lens. And he would put his samples at the end of a needle and then adjust it and bring the sample into focus, uh, whatever sample it is. And he, what he did unique was he went out and he collected some water from a pond nearby and he was looking at it. And he saw a bunch of small minute creatures floating around, single cell organisms, uh, microbes, which were floating around in the water. So he is credited as the father for microbiology, the entire field of microbiology where they look at a variety of these microorganisms in the water. So, Microscope basically corresponds to micros, which means small, plus scopio, so look at. So look at small things, that's what the whole microscopy world is. So obviously Wikipedia has a lot of information. Nowadays, if you Google these things, you can actually find a lot of information if you're interested. Um, and also ucmpberkeley.edu, that's the website where they have a bunch of information about history of microscopy. Now we are quite, obviously from 1665 we have come quite far. <clears throat> so how far can, I, can we actually zoom into material now? Okay. So from that, I'd like to pass around, this is gear, a metal, metal gear. So if you guys want to touch it, you can touch it. So um, if you look at a gear like that, let's see if this video plays. To the naked eye, this is just a broken toothed gear. It's made of conventional steel composed mainly of iron and a small amount of carbon. This small quantity of carbon is enough to protect the gear from corrosion, but not enough to make it indestructible over time. To increase steel's resistance, other elements are added. Nickel, manganese, chrome. This way, hundreds of different types of steel are made. As we move closer, this fracture allows us to discover the structure of the alloy. A rugged landscape materializes. Here and there are scattering of white specks. They're tiny particles of dust that have settled on the surface. Each of these petal-shaped forms is a particle of steel called dendrite. An alloy of iron and carbon Dendrite is found in all solid matter that crystallizes in cooling. It's so you, found in steel. So you can see a number wood, here. That's showing the magnification. Steel. When cooled rapidly, steel increases in strength, a process known as tempering. 
Between the particles, a cavity is outlined. We'll continue our journey through this hole, which is probably due to the aging of the metal. In the background, a grain of perlite emerges from the shadows. It's easily recognized by its characteristic sliced structure. The thick black diagonal cutting through the perlite contains a little more carbon than the lighter areas around it. So do the other thin lines. It's this extra carbon that gives the darker color. The fuzzy black and white flecks are faults in the structure brought into focus by the microscope. <coughs> At maximum enlargement, a series of tiny regular spots appear. Here, at last, is the atomic structure of steel. Atoms of iron and carbon regularly stacked in all directions. gives you an idea about how deep we can go you know in the in the world that is something we cannot see with our eyes okay. so all that level of microscopy is actually completely doable in uh, PNNL also with a number of our microscopes so, so that was a lot of magnification into the material right now in the current world, synthesizing materials is almost like cooking. So you have the periodic table of elements, you have a variety of elements available. You can take those and pick and choose different elements and mix them together in a unique way. And depending upon which elements you choose, as well as how they are arranged at an atomic scale, you can get really interesting properties. So almost all the modern materials are made, custom made by picking specific elements because of their performance or specific properties and then mixing them together, heating them and then solidifying it into some solid form. Okay. So what is more, what, so what is the most important thing to know about your material is what type of atoms are there or which element is there and how they are arranged and if you so if you take any material and you keep dividing it into smaller and smaller pieces atom is the final piece that you can't divide it further without losing its character okay so one atom will have a nucleus with a proton with few protons and neutrons and outside that you will have some electrons revolving around so that's kind of the smallest unit which will have all the properties of its original thing and then you arrange these atoms in really periodic fashion to get properties that they exhibit. So here you have a model it's of silicon carbon. You have two type of uh, two type of atoms. So if you see in different angles, you can see there are preferentially preferential alignment. It's very oriented. It's not random. Okay, a lot of the material in the world is aligned in a very particular. If you, if you keep zooming in, eventually you will see these atoms are arranged in a very particular fashion which gives its properties. So, just to give you an idea that, uh, okay. So, to give you the idea about, if you change the arrangement of atoms, even if it is the same type of atoms, if you change the arrangement of atoms, you will have an entirely different performance. 
Okay. So this photo is actually the iceberg lake at uh, Glacier National Park. I went there with my wife. Uh, we hiked up there, <coughs> and this picture has a number of things there. Obviously, there is water, and there are some icebergs, small icebergs floating there. There's snow there. Okay. Now, both water and the snow is actually made of H2O. But the difference is, so there is obviously one oxygen uh, molecule and two hydrogen, uh, <coughs> sorry, one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. If you look at the water, they are all running around all over the, all over the place. They are not sitting in perfectly ordered manner. Okay? So they have some sort of bonding in between them, which is hydrogen bonding, which keeps it in the form of water, which goes off when you boil it. But as you cool this down, eventually you get this perfect ordered arrangement of this which results in beautiful things like snowflakes so obviously you know that water behaves very differently from a snowflake right so this is a clear example of how if you take the same type of atoms and rearrange it in a different way you can get entirely different properties <coughs> Now let's go to <clears throat> one class of material which we depend upon very heavily. So if you look down to your chair, if you, if you all look at your chair, the frame there is actually made of steel. <coughs> now that steel was dirt somewhere and somebody actually mined it, took it into a blast furnace or some other way of uh, some other furnace. And then it, the, the dirt has iron oxide in it. So it's a compound between iron and oxygen. So somebody did the effort of taking that oxygen out of that iron ore, getting pure iron. And pure iron is actually <coughs> soft, so you can't directly use it for these kind of structural purpose. So they put it into another furnace, and then they melt it, and they add, <coughs> just like the video was telling, they'll add other elements like vanadium, niobium, manganese, things like that and melt everything together into a big pot. So this pot is of the size of this room almost. I worked in the steel plant. That, this was a photo that I took from the steel plant that I was working. So this one was as tall as this room and quite, quite, quite big actually. And they would heat the mixture of uh, the iron as well as other elements to 1600 degrees C, degrees Celsius. So it's really boiling molten and then they will pour it into a mold and cast it. Casting is nothing but if they pour it somewhere and let it cool down, then it becomes solid. And then they roll it just like how you make a tortilla, literally. And in the end, you get sheets which you can use as a side panel of a car or the chases of a car or the front crash bumper of a car, things like that. That's, this is an example of steel. Now, the same thing is done for titanium alloys, for example. I mean, I, my PhD was on titanium alloys. So they again are, from some ore, they extract it and they cast it or forge it into final shape, which goes into aeroplanes and other structures. So if you look at the metals and alloys, there are many different types of metals and alloys which we depend upon on a regular basis. So aluminum alloys, they are, they are plenty in the car. I mean, if you take the whole weight of car, almost more than 50% of it is probably coming from metal. <coughs> Even the engine block, engine block is made of metals. Uh, all, if you just open the bonnet, you will see it's, it, there is plenty of metals and alloys around in our world. Now, small things like chairs uh, to cell phones. I mean, cell phones, a lot of the cell phones have aluminum panels on the back side of it. Uh, cars, buses, airplanes, buildings, nuclear reactors. I mean, we, have, we are in a place with a lot of nuclear reactors. So even nuclear reactors need a lot of structural materials, which are <laughs> steels and other things. Uh, thermal power plants, coal power plants, na natural gas power plants. I mean, you can, literally there is so much metals and alloys that is around us. I mean, even these panels are actually aluminum, aluminum alloys. So all around us, there is a lot of metals and alloys which are there. Now, most of, how many of you know about blacksmiths? Everybody know about blacksmiths, right? So from the Iron Age, we have been uh, working, I mean, so heating and beating and then forming it into swords or other things. 
Now, previously we didn't know why when you take an iron rod, heat it up and then beat it up into a form of a rod, you put it in water and cool it, then it's a hard saw. If you keep it outside and cool it, it will be really soft. You can't use it as a saw. Okay. Previously people did not know why. But with the microscopy, we can actually look deep into the atomic level and what we can see is that the only thing that changed is the arrangement of atoms. So it's the same type of atoms, but they are arranged differently. And when you quench it in water, you get an arrangement which gives it really, which makes it really strong. If you leave it outside, it arranges in a way where it's really soft. So this is an image of, this is a high resolution uh, TEM image of a titanium alloy. So all these individual dots that you are seeing, just like what was shown in the video are individual titanium atom columns as well as molybdenum columns. So there are some colors, there are some grayscale contrasts where you see some areas are dark and some areas are bright. That's, these are the information which you can get. If you change this and make everywhere the same contrast, the property of that titanium alloy will be completely different. So it's very important to understand the atomic arrangement of materials so that we can understand why it behaves the way it is. Okay. If you look at the world of uh, computers, so the first computer or first major computer was of the size of this room or larger. Okay. Now we can hold it in our hand. Okay. Now it's really a big miniaturization. This wouldn't have been possible if there was no, if, if there was no materials research, making materials that are capable of doing that level things at a really small dimension. Okay. So microchips, everybody probably is aware of microchips right now. So there's a nice video which I found from an NSF funded center. Uh, they look at the, uh, they actually zoom into one microchip and show you how how intricate those designs are. So let's see if this works. <coughs> it's a nice music, so. <laughs> <laughs> they are used in the electronic devices we use every day, our computers, our phones, our televisions, and even our cars. They are microchips. Microchips are tiny electronic circuits. These small chips send and receive signals as electrical pulses and rapidly do complex calculations on these signals. The microchips inside your computer receive input when we type on a keyboard, move a mouse, or receive data from the internet. The microchip you're seeing now is from a normal desktop computer. The job of this chip is to act like an electronic middleman. The chip interprets input from another part of the computer, like the keyboard, and sends this output to the main brains of the computer, a microchip called the central processing unit. As we zoom further in, we need to use a scanning electron microscope, or SCM, and the small gold wires will now appear to be huge white columns. These wires are the chip's link to the outside world. They provide power to the chip and also send signals to and from the chip. Now we see a well-organized landscape. The gridded pathways are tiny metal wires. Electrical pulses travel along these wires to go between different parts of the chip. These wires are the roads and highways of the microchip world. As we get closer, some pathways cross over others. This is because microchips are layered. This chip, which was made in the late 90s, has only four layers, while modern chips will have 12 or more. All these pathways lead to transistors, the basic building block of a microchip. From these simple building blocks, complex functionality can be built. For example, circuits that can add, subtract, multiply, or divide numbers. The pathways and transistors are about one micron or 1,000 nanometers across. The amazing thing is that by modern standards, this is huge. Newer chips often use transistors that are, are as small as 20 nanometers. 
This means that if we removed one of the old one micron transistors, we could fit 2,500 modern transistors in its space. And it's a good thing that transistors are so tiny because a modern microchip in your laptop can contain over 1 billion transistors. Advances in nanotechnology have not only made microchips smaller and faster, but also more energy efficient. So you can see how, again, how complicated that structure was. I mean, there's so much layers and channels. What you have to realize is somebody made it, right? So down there in Intel, actually, they cannot make things of this dimension, this really intricate materials. Now, if you want to make things at that dimension, you need to see that see things at that dimensions too, right? If we can't see it based on our eyes. So that's another need why we need microscopy. So just to give you the sense of scale, so all of our hair on head, if we take it and put it in a scanning electron microscope, that's basically the image of somebody's hair, okay? So typically they can vary. My hair is about 100, and 100, 100 microns or so uh, diameter. Uh, this particular hair is probably close to about 60. Uh, so that, that entire line, that length of line is what, this line is actually, entirely 100, 100 microns. So if you cut this a long length, so if you cut it this way by half, you can make two 50 micron sized uh, pieces, okay? Now size of one red blood cell is about six to eight microns. One white blood cell is about 12 to 15 microns. Now, if you take this hair and cut it 100 times, obviously you can get one micrometer, okay? It might be a little smaller than this, this was approximate. Now, if you take this and then divide it by another thousand times, you get one nanometer, okay? So that's the damage. So the device that they showed just before, and they said that in the modern transistors, the dimension of one transistor is 10 to, 4, 10 to 15 nanometers. So you can, you can imagine how small it is, one device, okay? Size of one carbon atom is 0 0.07 nanometer, so it's even lower than one nanometer, okay? So we are talking really about a hidden world which we don't have direct access to just by our eyes. So let's say somebody blindfolded you and he gave you a walking stick. So, first you got a really thick walking stick. It's light, but really thick, okay? And they asked you, okay, go from here to outside. So obviously you won't be able to find corners and all that, because if it is too big, you can't really figure out what is going on, right? How, how smooth the surface is or how rough the surface is. But if they give you a thinner one, you have a better perception of it. Okay, I can kind of feel what is there, mm -hmm. right? So even in the world of microscopy, depending upon what probe you use, so if you if you imagine uh, when your eyes are closed, the only sensory perception you are getting is from the walking stick. So if you have a really small, thinner walking stick, you have a better perception of the world around you. So same way in microscopy, if you use a probe that has a smaller wavelength, you can resolve smaller things in the middle. So resolution is nothing but, so I have a series of two, two dots here. So resolution is when can you not tell those two dots are two different dots and they are a single dot. So if you can resolve a, that those two dots as two dots, it makes sense. I mean, so that means your eye is able to resolve that. So same way in microscopy, the higher the resolution, the better imaging you can do. So most of us must be familiar with uh, optical microscopes which we use in biology labs and other things, where we look at a cell, right? So you have a light source and you have a transparent or a thin sample on a, on a holder. Uh, the light goes through it, an objective 
uh, lens collects that light and an eyepiece magnifies that image. You can see the images of a cell or anything. And then there is a, in, in 1920, uh, electron was discovered. Uh, and they figured out that if you shoot an electron beam, you can use an electromagnetic lens and steer the electron wherever you want. Uh, you can focus it or defocus it, things like that. So in 1931, Ernest Fruska designed the first transmission electron microscope. So it's nothing but an old school uh, overhead slide project. I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with that because nowadays it's not there. In India, we, when I was growing up, we had these overhead projectors where you would have a box with a light, powerful light in it, and professor will write notes on a transparent plastic sheet and put it on it and the light will go through and hit the mirror and that will project onto a big wall. So nowadays it's not there, so the new generation, <coughs> I'm sorry, you, you may not know it. So, but the transmission electron microscope is very similar to that. So I'll explain it in the next one. So this is in Intel, Intel in Portland has a transmission electron microscope, which they use to look at these kind of really small devices that they are making. So Obama had visited there, this is an image from Intel. So <coughs> let me go to the next slide and explain what's a transmission electron microscope and scanning electron microscope. So there are two types of, mainly two types of electron microscopes. One is a scanning electron microscope, the other one is a transmission electron microscope. So first, uh, scanning electron microscope. Let's say you are walking into a room, you don't know what is there in the room, and it is dark inside, and you are given a flashlight in your hand. So what will you do? You will walk in, and you will start uh, scanning the flashlight, and the flashlight from your, the, the light from the flashlight will go and <coughs> hit whatever is there in the room, and bounce back. The light that comes back goes and hits your eye, the eye sends that signal to brain and then as we scan all across, it forms an image of what is there in that room, right? So in an electron microscope, the flashlights get replaced by an electron, electron column or an electron source. Instead of light, it will be electron beam coming out. Uh, instead of our hand scanning, there will be electromagnetic coil scanning the electron beam. And instead of the room, you have a sample, whatever you want to look at. Let's say microchip or your hair or whatever. And then the electron beams hits that material and bounces back and goes and there's a detector. Instead of our eye, there is a detector in the scanning electron microscope which collects the electrons which are bouncing back. And the computer attached to it, instead of our brain, processes the image as it scans. Okay, So that's how a scanning electron microscope works. So this is a scanning electron microscope which we have in MCEL in PNNR. This is an image which I personally took of nano uh, gold nano rods. These are roughly 300 nanometers in length and about 20-30 nanometers in uh, diameter. So we can resolve up to few tens of nanometers using a really good scanning electron microscope. This is a really powerful scanning electron microscope which we have. We have many of them in PNNR. Now, okay, this lets you see up to about 10 nanometers or so. But if you want to see atoms, that's not enough. So the acceleration voltage which you give to the electron beam or the power of that flashlight or power of the electron gun determines how much the wavelength of that electron beam will be. So if you have an even more powerful lamp, you can actually make the wavelength smaller <laughs> and have a better resolution. So that is what the transmission electron microscope comes into picture. So the slide projector thing that I was talking about. So you have a really powerful flashlight, which is in the form of an electron beam, which is a 300 kV kilowatt accelerated electron beam coming down a column. These are almost, uh, almost as tall as this room. So these one microscope is that tall. And your sample is inserted somewhere in the middle of the column which is a really thin sample. Again, just like the transparency, you have to use a really transparent sample which, through which electron beam can pass through. And instead of the wall where you are projecting, you have a phosphor screen here or a camera here which will take the images. So 
It's the same idea of a slide projector, but using electron beams going through a sample. So this is an image of a gold nanoparticle uh, embedded inside an MGO matrix. We use this um, as a sensor for some stuff, some of the work. Each dot you are seeing is an individual atom column. Okay. Now, photography, when you are taking still photos, it's actually a two-dimensional image always. You are, you are taking a 2D projection of a 3D thing, right? If you're, buying, if you're going to buy a car, if you see a bunch of pictures in Craigslist, sure, I mean, you, you, you know, okay, it's probably good. You still don't know. If somebody walks around that thing and takes a video of it, you have a better understanding about how that car is. Better will be if you can go and sit there and see the car, yeah, you're probably happy with the car. But in the atomic world, you can't go there and see the atoms, right? <laughs> now, this is only the photos which you can take right now, so far, right? So, actually, it's three-dimensional, like this model here. It's three-dimensional arrangement of atoms. So, <laughs> these kind of 2D images gives us some information, but it's averaged across the thickness, or it's only two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional thing. So, that's something that I am working on quite a lot since last seven, eight years. So, <coughs> okay. so the technique that can see material, see atoms in 3D or the arrangement of <coughs> atoms in 3D is known as anamorphic tomography. So that is basically entering the world of three-dimensional imaging. So whatever you want to analyze, you make a needle specimen out of it. Say you want to analyze a piece of the steel of that chair. So we make a really sharp needle out of it first, and then we put it in this in an ultra high vacuum chamber where we apply electric field on the surface of that needle as well as a laser. So by using that laser and electric field, you can individually evaporate atoms from the surface, which goes and hits a detector, and that detector basically records where that atom came and hit. Okay? And also, if you imagine, if you're applying the same electric field, if you have a heavy atom versus a light atom, they will fly differently. If you have a light atom, it will fly faster. If you have a heavy atom, it will fly slowly. So, based on that time of flight, you can say which atom it is. So, you get which atom it is and the position where it came from. And if you put that together, you can get a three-dimensional model of the atomic arrangement in the materials. That's what atom tomography is. So, the best thing of atom tomography is that it has really high spatial resolution, 0.2 nanometers in X, Y, and Z. So you can get a 3D movies of your material at a really high resolution. And it has a really high sensitivity, so it can image all the elements in the periodic table. So, Essentially, it gives you 3D nanometer scale compositional mapping of materials. So what you get out of Adam Probe is movies like this, where this is basically a material with uh, gold nanoparticles embedded inside a uh, cerium oxide material. This is also again some sensor for sensing some specific gases. And what you are looking at is a 3D image of the material where each yellow dot corresponds to the gold atom and the red and the blue <coughs> dots correspond to the cerium oxide. Ceri one is cerium and the other one is oxygen. So, looking at that, you can find out what is the shape of these nanoparticles. Each of these nanoparticles are less than 5 nanometers. So, previously I told you how small 1 nanometer is, right? So, we are looking literally at about 100 nanometer by about 60 by 60 nanometer region of a big material, really high uh, spatial resolution imaging of materials. Now, 
that's one technique which we have. Additionally, in PNNL, we have many different microscopy techniques all across many different groups, the majority of which falls in one building named Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory. That's where I used to be until a few months ago. I actually recently transitioned to a, the Material Science Directorate uh, PCSD. Now, there are transmission electron microscopes, many different scanning electron microscopes. Atom, we have one atom probe tomography, which I just talked about. Uh, there are some things known as helium ion microscope. Uh, there are many different microscopy techniques. And we use, I don't know how many projects utilize uh, microscopy techniques in PNNL. There are many of them. Now, specifically between in my group, we work on many different materials, semiconductor nanostructures, just like what was shown in the video, we look at uh, semiconductor devices collaborating with industries where they want to look at really, really small devices, whether it was built correctly or did that layers form as they expected it to be. We use atom probe as well as transmission electron microscopes to look at the how accurate their design and building was. Structure all other things around you, uh, all the metallic materials that I talked about. Soft and biological materials. I haven't actually, I'm, I'm by training, I'm a material scientist, but we have a lot of biologists also in the lab who is interested to see, can you see a cell? Can you zoom into a cell and see it in 3D like this? So we are trying to work towards it. Right now it doesn't exist, but we are working towards building capabilities like that. Geological minerals. Obviously, there is a lot of interest in geology and other areas for carbon sequestration and many different applications. Energy materials, battery and catalysis. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about it in the 14 minutes I have. Uh, atmospheric aerosols, I'll tell you some things about that too. So the first thing that I talked about in the atom probe is you have to make a needle out of whatever material you want to analyze. So let's say you want to analyze the steel again, the one which is used for the chair. So what you would do is you will cut a small piece of it and then put it in a scanning electron microscope also having a FIB capability or focused ion beam system. So what it is capable of is, so if you, if you have seen videos of people who are really good with guns, they can shoot and write their name on a wall, right? So imagine if you have a bullet of the size of a atom or an ion, a few nanometers, you can shoot and write things at that scale using electromagnetic lenses which can act as the controllers for that instead of somebody's hand and scale. So that system is known as focused ion beam system. It's typically uh, an attachment in addition to the scanning electron microscope where you have just like the flashlight thing that I was talking about. We have additionally a gallium ion column which shoots these gallium ion bullets onto the material. You can cut things and write things in really, really small damage. Okay. So let's say this is that steel that you want to analyze. So you, you take an image of the area. And then you can also weld things at really small dimension because of the capability that you have this really high resolution electron column. You can use it to weld things and protect things and all. So this is a platinum deposition which is about 10 micrometer long. So you, you remember your hair is about 100 microns. So it's one tenth of it. That's, that's the length of it. And the width is only one micron. So you put a really thin capping. And then you go and use that gallium gun and cut out from either side of this, you cut a trench out and then you extract a small piece of it using a nano needle. So a nano needle is, it's, it's a needle basically which you can control in very, very small length scales. So we have that also in this FIP system. So using that, you will, so you will first cut a wedge and then you bring that nano manipulator and then weld it again here and then cut this side also. And then you can extract a small piece of what you want to analyze to attach into another substrate. So substrate, these are the holders for the atom proof system. So which are basically, you can't even see it. It's really small, uh, probably 5 mm by 3 mm uh, size silicon wafers with these kind of posts already built in there. So we bring this thing, we take it out and then we bring it there and attach it on top of one of those needles and then weld it there and then we can weld it there, cut it so we have one piece. So from one lift out, we can actually make many different needles. 
So once you have that wedge, this piece, we go in with a donut shape pattern, again using the gallium bullets. You can cut out and cut out a cylindrical specimen of your material. And if you keep reducing the internal the inner diameter of that donut, you can eventually get a really, really sharp needle of your material. That's how we make needles of whatever material we want to analyze using Arab. Okay. So this whole process probably takes about a day. And in the end, you get really small, almost things you can't see. But the amount of information which you can get from that is enormous. So this is an example of from my PhD project, which is uh, about the alloy which we use to make the landing gears of airplanes. So this is a Boeing airplane, so the landing gear is a, that's the thing which takes the whole force when it hits the ground, right? So it has to be really strong. So what we could see using uh, the electron microscopy as well as Adam Pro is that at the nano scale, this particular alloy had titanium and molybdenum atoms in that. Now, what normally we would imagine is if you put two elements and mix it together and heat it and cool it, they may sit everywhere kind of equally, right? But if you zoom down into the atomic scale, what we could see is that there were these pockets where a bunch of these moly atoms would come together and form a what is known as a precipitate. And the distribution of these precipitates completely changes the way the material behaves. Okay? So just by doing atom probe and electron microscopy, we could see that. And then we can find out ways of changing that by doing heating and cooling, just like how the blacksmiths do. We can, at an industrial scale also, we can heat and cool materials differently and change this arrangement. So this is one example. This is another recent example where we made the strongest titanium alloy ever made right now. So uh, this, this paper is just going to come out. Uh, but this is, this, is a, this is again another titanium alloy, which the, the, the good thing is this was made by a really low cost process. So typically titanium is very expensive. So that's why it is typically used only in airplanes and uh, high end applications, defense applications and other things. If we can replace the steel in our car using titanium, we can save so much fuel. Okay? So the fuel economy can go really high. But the problem is it's very costly to produce right now. So what we did was we designed a new alloy which could be made using a low cost process. And once we made it, we can look at, this is a scanning electron microscope image. And this particular alloy has titanium, aluminum, vanadium, iron atoms. Now again, if you mix all of those things, you would think that they'll sit everywhere uniformly. But as you magnify in, you can see that there are some black regions and there are some bright regions. And if you look within the bright regions, there are these smaller black regions of that same thing that was there. And by running atom probe, you can find out which atom is sitting where. So what we could see is the aluminum atoms are actually preferentially sitting in these black, small black precipitates. And that gives it the strength that we are seeing. So literally, often the, way, the, the answer to why a material behaves the way it is lies at really, really small dimension. And it's, it's on a routine basis we find that in many of our research. Another area of interest, lithium ion batteries. I mean, when we buy a new laptop or a cell phone, when you just get it, you charge it overnight, it runs beautifully for many days. But after six months or a year, it will die by the next day. I mean, if, even if you charge whole night, it will die by the next day morning, right? So there's a lot of, there's many, many different applications which are using lithium ion batteries right now. Now, another thing is, there's a big push on developing solar and wind energy, which are not a continuous production. If, if we have hydropower plants, <laughs> You have water coming continuously, you can keep producing electricity and whether you use it or don't use it, you can keep producing it. Okay? But wind and solar, you can't keep producing it and using it because only in the daylight you get solar energy. At night you don't have it. So if you need to use the energy at night, you need to depend upon batteries. So there's a huge work going on in PNNL trying to develop new generation of batteries. And 
often we get these kind of messages. Okay, so uh, your battery is almost going to die, and then you have to find, you have to run away and find out a charger and all that. It's an animation; it's not actually happening. Now, in a real battery, what happens is when you so there are two electrodes, an electrolyte that those are the main heart of a battery. So there's a cathode and an anode. And these cathodes are typically lithium-based oxides of many different elements. Lithium nickel oxide, lithium manganese oxide, lithium nickel manganese oxide, many different oxides. And typically they are nanoparticles of about 200 nanometers or so in dimension. They basically look like powders and they paste it on an they stick it on an aluminium sheet which acts as an electrode. And there's an anode which is again graphite or silicon or many different materials which act as the other electrode. And when you charge it, the lithium ions go from the cathode to the anode. And when you use it on a regular basis, it slowly migrates back into the uh, cathode. Now, you can imagine as you keep doing this again and again, eventually what happens is the structure of the cathode goes, down, goes back. So it's very important to understand how it goes back so that you can make materials that do not do that. So how do you make a needle out of a nanoparticle? So nanoparticles are really small, right? I mean 200 nanometers or so. So you can't do that cutting and lifting out because it's really, really small. So what we do is we put it on a, on a surface and then go into that same needle, that nano manipulator that I was talking about just touch that nanoparticle, it gets stuck on the needle. And then you go and touch on the micro tip array, which was that post where that other sample was placed. And then you coat it, and then you can build it into a nanoparticle. So it's actually somewhat of an artful process. It is, I mean, so literally art and science goes together pretty well. So this is one example of that. And then you can run TEM, uh, transmission electron microscopy, or Atom probe and understand how the elements are distributed. So this particular example is of a lithium nickel manganese oxide. So it had lithium atoms, manganese atoms, nickel atoms, and oxygen atoms. Now, based on how it is synthesized or how it is made or how it was cooked, basically, we were seeing that we were either getting a uniform distribution of all of these elements or we were getting the nickel was kind of segregating. Nickel atoms were kind of binding to other nickel atoms and enriching in certain regions. So what we found by this is, so we did, we cooked it one way or we made it one way and then we looked at how the atoms are enriched. We saw that they are segregated and the performance wasn't that great. Then they could go back and change the synthesis and get it rather uniform and we verified it by using the microscopy and we could see that the battery performance improved quite dramatically. So using these kind of methods you can really design materials that probably will come into devices tomorrow. This is another example, this is a little more complicated but I will try to explain. So uh, these are magnetic materials which is, goes into transformer cores and electric motors and others. These are also again complex materials which has iron, cobalt, silicon, copper, and I'll be many different elements in there. Each added for a particular reason and if you zoom in using an atom probe we could see that there were copper atoms were clustering at like a 5 nanometer or lower level which completely determines how that material behaves. So this is one another example. And we also have, so just like how Intel would make that microchip, we have people at PLNL who can actually design materials atom by atom. So what they have is they have a surface, they have a substrate and they have uh, a source of atoms where they can control, selectively send one atom at a time or a few atoms at a time onto that surface and arrange them in a specific manner. So that's, this is, these are examples of a strontium, titanium, <coughs> lanthanum uh, element. It's, uh, so basically these are uh, lanthanum nickel manganese oxide on a strontium titanate film. So these are used for next generation microchip devices and other things. So again the same story that they thought when they put lanthanum, nickel, manganese and oxygen atoms and send it 
control in a controlled manner to a substrate they will land uniformly and they will get great properties but when we ran atom probe of that film what we saw was all the nickel were kind of segregating together they would like to bind together within that in the form of like nanoparticles in a matrix and that completely changed the behavior of that material from what they were expecting so this is another example so the main message that i want to communicate is we not only look at the way the materials are right now we also make the materials the way we want so there are many different processing methods to make materials also so i think i have one minute but let's say i might actually go overboard a little bit so this is another large scale example i i worked in mclm environmental molecular science laboratory which is a doe ber funded facility ber is biological and environmental research so they are very interested in uh, research related to environment uh, and biology so this is a simulation which was made by nasa where they looked at what sort of particles are in the atmosphere so when you have light shining through in a nice sunny day you see some things kind of running around in that light right so those are not as atmospheric particulates so if you look at the whole world and whole earth and see what all type of particles come there are so many different events going so there are these big deserts where when you have a sandstorm you have all these dust going into the atmosphere then you have this enormous area of ocean where when you have waves it sends sodium chloride basically salts sodium chloride potassium chloride all these sea salt into the atmosphere that's a big component then you have wildfires when you have these huge wildfires they emit these carbonaceous material into the atmosphere all the cars and all other vehicles all of them emit carbonaceous material and other chemicals into the atmosphere pollution uh, sulfates are actually obviously the pollution i mean industry emits now there are wind currents also you we heard about jet stream quite a lot right there is wind currents going all across the globe what happens is you have a continuous mixing of all these different things okay and one interesting thing is if you start measuring the temperature right from the earth surface and keep going up you'll see the temperature starts dropping as you go higher so below the zero degrees or above the zero degrees up to the surface in the clouds you have small water droplets and if you keep going up there is there is there are cloud if there are clouds in that zone between 0 to minus 40 degrees c you will see the clouds have water droplets as well as ice crystals if you keep going further up you will have clouds with entirely ice crystals okay now if you think about rain or snow both of them depend upon the presence of these dust particles so the rate the snowflakes would love to form on a small dust particle which is on the cloud coming from any of these events and then grow into the snowflake now old times when there was no pollution if there is a big uh, snowstorm in china and the dust comes into atmosphere it goes into the cloud it drifts across the globe and it comes to the western united states and then under the right condition it will nucleate snow or basically ice crystals and it will become snow and fall on the on all of, all of our pacific northwest as well as uh, california and other areas now when you have pollution what happens is it's traveling across the globe with that pollution along with the natural dust particles so those pollution would work on it will modify the surface of that so what we were finding is that pollution can actually change the surface of that dust particle and make it even harder to nucleate ice and reducing the snow so this whole phenomenon is surrounded around the dust particles in the atmosphere so if you take one dust particle and zoom in you can actually look at what it is actually and what is it made of we have a huge atmospheric uh chemistry program going on in pnnl where some of us material scientists are working with them to try to understand how this dust particle look and what is their role in the atmosphere so this is an example of how you can collect some of these dust particles from a desert and then put it on a substrate take one dust particle and make a needle out of it and then you can run an atom probe and then you can understand the particular dust particle was taken from arizona 
uh, in one of the desert, which is kind of a standard sample which is used for as a as a surrogate for what is there in the sky. We could see that they are aluminium silicate. It had aluminium atoms, silicon atoms, oxygen atoms. Additionally, it had some minor impurity phases, magnesium, potassium, iron. Now, if you treat this with sulfuric acid, let's say you have sulfuric acid vapors in the air, they will take out some of these elements. Now, interestingly, what we are seeing is the presence of some of those elements depends, I mean, it is necessary for forming these ice crystals, which will not happen if the pollution modifies those things. So this is another interesting idea about how microscopy can help us. The final example that I want to show you is, now, all, most of the things were natural, right? So no, most of the things that I talked about was engineering related. Now, in the natural world also, there is a lot of interesting things which we don't understand fully. So, for example, one of my collaborators from University of Oregon, he's actually also a part-time scientist at LIGO, he was fascinated with uh, naturally hard uh, biomaterials. So, he would look at things like teeth of an ant or scorpion sting or many different things like spider fang. Uh, so he has these things, he grows these things and he brings me one teeth of an ant, which is what this is. This is the scanning electron microscope of image of one teeth of an ant. And then I would go in, cut a small piece of it from the tip of it using the focus diamond beam system, attach it onto the holder again and make a needle out of it and run it. And interestingly, what we found was there was zinc in it. There was zinc present in the ant teeth, only in the adult ant teeth. So we, actually analyze the teeth of a young ant and an old ant. So what we could see was in the young ant teeth there is no, not much zinc present but when you run, when you look at an old ant teeth it looks hard and, and my collaborator have even taken it to the next level where he has, I think he has gone to some rainforest and observed these and he has found that initially as they are born they don't cut leaves and once the zinc accumulation has gone high enough it becomes strong enough that it can cut leaves so it starts cutting and as it keeps cutting, eventually the, the teeth will wear off and then it will become carrier. And he has done amazing work looking at the behavior of ants and connecting how the information that we can get at a really narrow scale, how that connects to real behavior of ants. So overall, the atomic world of materials is really fascinating, whether it is in 2D or 3D. Both ways you can see many interesting things. Now most of the engineering products around you came into existence as a result of many many years of research and development. Mm -hmm. Now often the material performance is directly dependent upon what type of atom is there and how they are arranged. And there are many different types of microscopes available to look at the way of the way atoms are arranged. And many of us do that routinely at PNL for many different areas of research. And if you do get a chance to own a microscope, I really encourage you to look, go out and see things on your own. Okay? There are a lot of cheap uh, optical microscopes which you can buy from Amazon and you might find really amazing things just like how Robert Hooke found things or uh, Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek found. Okay? So there are many of these, there are some of the videos that I showed, obviously none of the videos showed was my own production, it was all from uh, searching around and finding the best one possible. So these are some of those literate, the references for where I found those videos. Uh, and a lot of the work that I presented was done at MCEL, which I told is a BER funded facility. Uh, it's at PNNL. Uh, it's one of the central buildings in PNNL. We have, I mean, I, I have only probably shown a fraction of what we can do. I mean, there's so many projects and so many different types of microscopes uh, at MCEL. And some of my students are here actually, uh, who is working with uh, some of the instruments. Uh, the funding for most of the work came from Chemical Imaging Initiative. So sometimes we have internal laboratory level funding to work on interesting projects to find out, new, design new materials or understand how, why a material behaves the way it is. So those are these two initiatives, Chemical Imaging Initiative or MS3 initiative. And the titanium alloy work was specifically, the material development part of it was funded by Office of Vehicle Technology of Department of Energy. Uh, so, and as I said earlier, it's not just my work, it's the work of 
a bunch of my colleagues and external collaborators and all others. So obviously their contribution is fully acknowledged. So overall, thank you for your attention. I know it's really late. Thank you.